Hi guys, welcome to chapter two. So we're going to be talking about developmental context and theories of development. So if we look at development across cultures and time periods, life stage concepts have really been a part of human history for forever, for thousands of years. The ancient Hindu is probably one of the oldest uh, descriptions of development. And they believe that life ideally was 100 years with four equal stages. And uh, the first stage, childhood, was what they called the apprentice stage. And that was a time of celibacy from birth to 25 years of old age, where um, they were given, each stage kind of had like role-related duties, and um, you knew generally what you were supposed to do. And there were rituals for each of the stages, as well as sub-stages, sub which we're not going to get into. Um, the ancient Greeks also had a development of uh, life stages. Um, this was written about 25 years ago by a man named Solon. And he said life was developed into these seven, um, seven year increments from birth to age 70. So 10 increments of seven years each. And they were really interesting um, if you look at the chart, just sort of how descriptive they are, because Greek is really a descriptive language, which is why it's still used today. Um, and not just in Greece, but you know, in, in the world in general. Uh, the first three stages really focused on physical development, with uh, the first 21 years being like immaturity, and then ages 20 to 28 is like the ripening stage. Um, ancient Jews also wrote in the Talmud about 1500 years ago a description, um, as well as instructions and ideals for, for each section, each stage of life. Um, the bar mitzvah, which they still celebrate today, that's when you are 13 years old um, for boys, and I believe it's called a bat mitzvah for girls. And this is a ritual that basically marks the age of moral responsibility and says you are now ready for marriage and for work, um, although that's not expected to happen until like 18 to 20 years old. The Jews didn't really have, ancient Jews didn't really have super young marriages, generally speaking. Um, and ancient Jewish tradition also centers more on cognitive rather than physical development, which I kind of find interesting. Um, and then you had medieval Europe, which had some pretty in-depth uh, descriptions of life stage development, like in the 14th century, 1300s. And uh, these stages include, um, I probably won't be able to pronounce it right, but Infantia, which is ages 0 to 7, Puritia, ages 7 to 14, Adolescentia, ages 14 to 21, and kind of upwards to 35, which is interesting because that's kind of, you know, kind of, actually all traditions kind of agree with that. Like 21 to 35 years old, you're just kind of becoming an adult. And then it's middle age when you're really an adult. And honestly, that's when you feel like an adult too, kind of. Um, adolescent show was considered the time of physical strength, vigor, and stature, along with cognitive maturity leading to rational judgment. Um, and I think we could all agree with these descriptions even today. Generally speaking, it's, it's pretty accurate. Um, so that sh really shows you that how similar people are. I think every single video I'm swatting a fly. <laughs> There's never a fly around unless I'm filming a video. Um, so anyhow, um, there, there's a lot of differences between how we look at development and yet the development is really the same. Even thousands of years ago, they're describing development the same way as we really, as we look at it now. Um, childhood was less paid attention to than any other stage, historically speaking. So the focus on childhood is really a modern sort of um, focus. Although you do see blips on the historical radar where childhood was more important and children were more uh, protected, and that is anytime there is a wealthy society. You can afford to um, pay more attention and coddle children if you have more resources. All right, um, so if we look at some traditional cultures, there, there's examples in your book you can read about, um, so I'm not going to go too much into it, but traditional cultures, there, there's different types of traditional cultures. And the, the gender roles, the roles of childhood, how, how free childhood was, how carefree it was, or how much responsibility a child has, 
Um, how much involvement the parents have and whether the dad or the mom is involved differs depending on the culture. And when adulthood starts also depends on the culture. So cultures, and this is really true of any culture, but kind of it's more pure and condensed in, in a traditional culture that's still living more native indigenous lifestyles. Um, because I don't know, modern, modern life just has so many more variables in it rather than, you know, a group of people living out in the Amazonian rainforest just doing life. Um, so we like to look at these traditional cultures and see how they behave. Um, this is a picture of uh, some kids in, oh no, I can't remember what they're called, the Kumani tribe, I believe, in the Amazon. And there's, there's multiple tribes, but they're a hunter-gatherer tribe and their children are described as like, or Yumani, so, I don't know, I'll have to look it up. Um, but their, their children are described as like the happiest on the planet. And you see that with a lot of these traditional hunter-gatherer cultures that their children are very happy. R really everybody seems to be happy. Um, but the children have these super carefree lives. They're not given much responsibility. They're just expected to go live and do their thing and play. And they just play all day long, away from the parents, by the way. They're not watched, even though there's alligators and anacondas in the Amazon and panthers and stuff. They're just expected, go do your kid's stuff. And then when you get older and you're interested in responsibility, then we'll give you responsibility. And they tend to be very happy. Um, so they have very few responsibilities. The parental involvement is fairly minimal, although the parents are very loving. Um, but they... They have expectations that children will take care of themselves and they'll be responsible. If there's a sharp knife around and the child picks it up, well, the kid will learn not to cut themselves a second time. If there's a fire, then the kid might burn themselves once, but they won't burn themselves a second time. They're expected to learn and they're expected to be responsible, and yet they're not given any responsibilities. It's an interesting sort of um, dynamic. Um, and adulthood happens when adulthood happens. Usually in the teenage years, they start becoming more interested. They want to hunt, they want to gather. And whenever they're interested, even as kids, if they want to help you know, pluck berries, they'll help for five minutes and then they'll go run off and play and the parents don't expect anything of them. Now, you think of that as a traditional culture, but there are different types of traditional cultures. So that's a hunter-gatherer. We also have nomadic cultures, which tend to be livestock-based. So you have um, the Mongolian nomads of Mongolia and they have reindeer just like the Sami people and teepees which is really weird how similar those cultures are so you have the Mongolians with reindeers and teepees you have the Sami which are white Europeans with reindeer and teepees and then you have the uh, the Midwestern Indians with horses and teepees Okay, so I don't know how those cultures, if they just thought of it independently or what, but it's just interesting. So anyhow, these cultures, um, they move from place to place and they usually depend more on livestock than on plants, although they might gather along the way, but they raise their own livestock. Usually kids have more responsibility and yet they also have a lot of freedom. I raise livestock and I, and I also have a garden, but livestock is my primary thing. And I can tell you, you have you take care of the livestock briefly during the day, and then you can go live your life. And that's really nice. I have also raised crops, and it's like you're constantly taking care of crops. So that's the, the next one. So you have settled agricultural cultures, and these are usually crop-based, and they really emphasize responsibility. You need to become a responsible adult. You need to contribute to society. And that's kind of the American culture. We emphasize responsibility with our children, although that's changed as we've moved away from agriculture. Um, but when we were a traditional culture and we were, you know, a hundred years ago, 90% of our population would have lived on a farm. And so that's really where we got that American work ethic, that value of you should work hard, you should pull yourself up by your bootstraps because we were all farmers and you have to work hard when you have a settled farm. Whether you're growing animals or crops or whatever, if you're settled and you are dependent on your food source, then you have to work hard. Um, Hunter-gatherers, they just get what they get and you know, you either starve or you don't, but there's no point in stressing about it. But if you are raising your own food, you have to stress because you have to take care of them. It's your responsibility. Okay, so responsibility is a bigger value. All right, um, so that is some of our cultural context to think about when you're thinking about children 
um, and how they're developing. All right, anyhow, let's get into the theories. So we have six different theories. We have psychological theory, cognitive, or psychosocial theory, cognitive, learning, biological, contextual, and cultural. So we're just going to briefly talk about these. We'll talk about them more in depth in a later chapter, but this is just sort of an introduction. So first we have our psychosocial, which you should remember from Psych 101. That's Erickson's psychosocial stages. He has the eight different stages. And so as you grow up, you're going through different um, developmental psychosocial uh, crises. So the first one you have with infancy, trust versus mistrust is a world of trustworthy place. If I cry, does somebody pay attention to me? Then you have toddlerhood with autonomy versus shame and doubt. Am I an independent person or, you know, am I my own person? Because you literally started as part of your mom's body. And now you have to develop the sense that I am my own independent person. Early childhood, initiative versus guilt. Can I take initiative? Can I do things? Um, if not, I feel guilty. Middle childhood is industry versus inferiority. Am I a hard worker? So this is when you start school. Am I a good student? Am I smart? Am I capable of working hard? Um, then you have your teenage years. And who, that's who I am as a person. Your um, identity versus identity confusion. Uh, then early adulthood, you're looking at relationships, so intimacy versus isolation. Middle adulthood, generativity versus stagnation, have I achieved something with my life? Because now middle age, you're like, wow, my death is coming soon. It's a weird feeling. Like I'm 39 and it's, it's a weird feeling to know like you're actually on the downhill slope of life. I don't know, it's weird. Um, and then late adulthood, did I do good with my life? So this is in ego integrity versus despair. Did, did I make the world a better place for my grandchildren? Um, and yes, that is a super ripped 70 year old man, which I just put that there because it's pretty amazing. Um, some other theories of child development, we've got Piaget. So Piaget really focused, Jean Piaget, who is Swiss French, I believe, and he really focused on cognitive development. So how do we think, how do we problem solve, how do, how does the way we think and problem solve change over time? Um, he believed that infant's cognitive development occurred in distinct stages and, um, and that these cognitive abilities organized into um, mental structures. So we develop these schemes or schema, which are Like a lot of people think of, you know, the structure you see around buildings, like the framework so that you can build, um, that's sort of what a schema is. So it's a framework to understand something. So when you think about um, masculinity, what are all the ideas that come to your mind when you think of masculinity? You're pulling all those ideas from your schema. You know, strong muscles, hard worker, independent, you know, if you think about femininity, you've got whatever values and thoughts come into your mind. So that's your schema, your framework for understanding a concept. Um, and he also said that our biological maturation triggers different stages. So you have growth spurts in your brain and that coincides with children's distinctly different ways of thinking about things. So you can actually measure the brain growth and see children start to think in different ways. And then he also said that children were active in their own development. They created their own experiences in order to learn. Uh, then we will talk about social learning theories. So we, are, we learn through relationship with other people. Um, Albert Bandura is one of the big names. He, um, he did the Bobo doll study. If you don't know what that is, YouTube it, or maybe I'll put a link on up for you guys to watch it. Um, and he, he said that we learn through observing what other people are doing, particularly role models, which are people with certain characteristics. So um, men tend to be stronger role models than women, older people more stronger role models than younger people. Um, people, if you're American, people with an English accent, we automatically believe that they're smarter, especially an upper class English accent, that they're smarter than other people. So we just automatically believe them more. People who use uh, big words, people who are educated. There's certain things that make people more impactful on, on you, okay? And then you have John B. Watson who and uh, Skinner, they were the behaviorists. John B. Watson did the little Albert experiment and Skinner was the one who conditioned rats and pigeons to behave in response to certain stimulus. Okay, so you've got behaviorism, 
social learning theory, these are how we learn. We develop because we are learning. Then you have the biological theories, evolutionary psychology, behavioral genetics, how do certain genes cause us to behave in certain ways, neuroscience, how does our brain anatomy cause certain behaviors. You know, if you're low on serotonin, you become depressed. These are all things that we study in order to understand children, just like we study them in order to understand adults. Um, and then the one that I like the best is the contextual theory. So my doctorate is actually in systems theory, uh, which is that second one down there. Ecological and systems theory is really the same exact thing. It's just um, ecological theory has more vocabulary to learn than systems. So these are saying that we develop because of our overarching context, because of all of the different thing, different systems that we are part of. So um, this little target thing is it's from ecological systems, um, but systems theory would say the same exact stuff, just again, without the vocabulary. So you have the individual, the micro, meso, exo, and macro system. So micro is the small environment, the small system that we're part of. So this is like your family, your school, your religious leaders, your friends, the, the people who are unique to you. Then we have the meso system, which is the relationships, the, it, the connections that we have um, within, uh, between the microsystems. Okay, so how, like a friend goes to church with you, that sort of connection. Then the exosystem is the larger society, and the macrosystem is our even larger cultural beliefs and values. And systems theory, and then you have the chronosystem, which is your historical context. So systems theory just makes it simpler and says we're all part of multiple systems, and those systems impact us, and we also impact and influence those systems. So you're part of political systems, school, church, family, um, you might be an Alcoholics Anonymous, you're also part, you're, you're American, uh, racially you might be Chinese, um, and if you're a Chinese immigrant then you're also very much connected to your Chinese culture and background, etc. Okay, so all of these systems impact who you are, but you also impact those systems. So it's an interactive relationship. And then you have cultural theory, which says, which is something we've talked about a lot, so I won't go into it, but I think this picture is amazing, so I just wanted to briefly show it. Um, cultural theory says that your culture impacts who you are. Okay, so obviously... Um, all of these theories are correct, right? Except for maybe a little bit with Freud. Um, but all of these theories are just different focuses on how to look at child development. Because for instance, if you're a child development researcher, you can't look at neuroscience and study culture. Well, you could, but it's hard. But you can't study neuroscience, culture, and religious impact, and how you learn, you know, you can't do everything at once. So theories just break things down so that it's easier to investigate, it's easier to understand, it's easier to organize the information that's coming in. So every single one of these theories is right, and is mostly right. They're just a different perspective, a different lens on looking how children, looking at how children develop. So um, for you, if you're going to go into child psychology, you might be more attracted to a certain theory than another theory. So I'm more attracted to systems theory um, because that's what my master's and doctorate was in. And it just made more sense to me to understand somebody, not just by looking at the individual like this is little Annie, the child, but also to look at the systems that she's part of. Um, in order to understand her. So you're not just looking at the tree, you're looking at the whole forest. All right, so anyhow, just a brief look at how um, culture affects us, how history has looked at child development, and how the different theories also look at child development. Okay, so if you have any questions, message me, and otherwise I will see you in the next chapter. Bye!